Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Martin Geier, Regional Manager of Amazon Web Services, Germany. Good morning. Is anybody here? Good morning. Hey. It's great that you are here. Thanks, thanks so much for coming. Seeing a, a few old friends and a lot of new faces. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Martin Geier. I'm with my team taking care of customers in Germany. Um, explaining the cloud, explaining AWS, and making sure customers and prospective customers can leverage the cloud to the benefit for the business. Now, since we last met, and think back when we a year ago met in Postbahnhof, for the ones who were there, it was a cozy little place, a little, little bit different than this one, but I hope you like it here too. Um, since we last met, there were a few things that um, customers of, our, of ours did and that we did. And before we go into the 2015 summit kickoff, I wanted to share a few things with you. So first, on, your cust on the customer's request, specifically from Germany and from Europe and elsewhere, we were hearing a lot about, well, we would like to use AWS, and we would like to use AWS even more. But we would like to do this with very, very low latency. And some of you asked, well, we would like to use you more, but we got to make sure our data remains on German soil, because that helps us keeping compliancy to our regulations. And on the back end of that, we were launching the 11th region of AWS, which is located in Frankfurt. It's a full region. It is consisting of two availability centers. And it's already vastly used by customers. So today, we're happy to announce that the Frankfurt region is the fastest growing international region of AWS ever. And it's not about us. It's about you, the customers, both internationally and specifically from Germany, who have made this happen. So on behalf of my team, this thanks is going out to you. Thank you so much for making this the fastest growing region ever. As a result of this, we continue to grow the team. So in fact, we are looking to hire an additional 130 individuals to the AWS team. Now, if you know talented engineers, researchers, uh, or account managers, or um, solution architects, and you don't work for one of our customers because we don't want to do that, um, please tap on their shoulders and send them our way. In fact, in our booth, we have our recruiting team. So just step by them and uh, say hello to them. We are hiring and we are growing the team. So we've noticed, obviously, that Berlin has a lot to do with innovation. But that's not limited only to Berlin. So Germany is about innovation. And to support that, we have thought hard. And what we are announcing today is that later in this year, we will have the AWS pop-up loft in Berlin. So you will scratch your head and say, what is, what is a pop-up loft? What is that? So we did this in San Francisco later, earlier this year, and we did this in New York. And the pop-up loft is a, um, a, a location you can walk up, you can go to, and you can learn a lot about AWS. You can talk to solution architects. You can get enablement and training. So we are planning to have the pop-up loft open in autumn this year in our new office in Krausenstraße. So if you feel you want to find out more about AWS, that's a perfect uh, location and occasion for you to gather more insight into the AWS. Now, obviously, Germany, and specifically Berlin, is about startups. So you know the folks around that have scaled a while. So SoundCloud, Vuga, for example, OneFootball, so the ones that are really the prominent large-scale startups. We are humbled that they are on AWS. But that's going all the way to the people in their Studentenbude who are building the first prototype of their application, who have a great idea, and who eventually build 
a minimum viable product and bring it out. So this whole range of startups we are happy to serve. And on the back end of that, we received a very strong statement from one of the company builders that are well known here, Rocket Internet. They are now recommending each of their new ventures to start their business on AWS. And in fact, also, they have recommended for, for some of their larger already scaled uh, ventures that they move to AWS. So we are really humbled by this statement from Rocket. Now, looking at the 2015 AWS Summit in Berlin, and for the ones who have been there, this has not changed over the last four things. There are three elements we want to do today, and we want you to walk away here a bit more inspired. We want everybody to walk away here this evening and say, well, I learned something. I didn't know that. And we want you to have this as a platform to get connected to other engineers and to other people from other companies and learn from them. Now, to break this down a little bit, we have around 2,000 guests today. So everybody who came here and who is taking a full day out of their agenda today, thank you so much for devoting this full day to AWS and to us. Thanks for that. What we are offering today are nine streams, nine tracks that are running in parallel after the keynotes. And you've seen there are colleagues of mine of AWS talking, and more importantly, there are customers talking. So we are humbled that 20 customer speakers are making an effort to talk about what they have done on AWS, how they are leveraging the cloud. So you find these 20 individuals uh, in the agendas that have been on your seats and outside at the panels. One speech didn't make it on the agenda. That's why I want to mention it here. It's a company from Berlin. Um, it's a company that's building the world's greatest location cloud. The company is called Nokia here. And we have Ali Abbas from Nokia here talking at the enterprise track at 1.50 in the afternoon. So if you're interested to learn about a great use case that's talking to the use of geospatial data that's stored on AWS in S3, that's probably your spot to go to. On the tracks, you may have noticed for the first time we have a public sector track. And we feel specifically excited about the opportunity to now work closer with the universities and schools of Germany and also with the public sector, with the administration. So if you are from one of these organizations, there's a specific track for you this afternoon. On learning and getting connected, you may have noticed there's a trade fair out there that's made full of partners. So check out the Partner Summit out there, please. If you feel you want to get trained hands-on here, there's an opportunity to do that. If you already know a lot, and you just want to get the certification, there's an opportunity to do that. And please don't miss out the startup booth. We have invited 10 startups from Germany. Amongst them are uh, Tato, for example, and they are here. So if you're a, a young, uh, talented startup that really wants to figure out how these guys worked and how these guys scaled their business on AWS, just grab them and have a talk with those guys. Now, on getting, on getting connected, we are really grateful that both uh, the partners but also the sponsors were helping us to organize all of this. So the partners you see up there, they not only contributed with a few funds to make this happen, but more importantly, they contributed with content. So if you have friends back in your office or back home who didn't make it here and you want to share something you learn here, Here's the feeds you can use, and we also got a Twitter wall out there. So leverage that. Now, without further ado, it's my real pleasure to welcome a great friend of the German enterprises, mid-market companies, and startups. He has been here for four times in a row, and he has helped us tremendously building this organization here. Um, there's one thing I want you to notice. If you want to know, if you haven't figured out where this person is coming from, what his nationality is, have a look at his shoes. Without much further ado, please welcome the CTO of Amazon.com, Dr. Werner Vogels. Werner, 
Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Guten Morgen, Berlin. Wie geht's es Ihnen? Uh, believe me, I, uh, no, I will not do it in German, no. I, I will not embarrass myself to that point. But thank you, thank you very much for all coming out here today um, in such large numbers. Um, I hope that today will be a very educational day for you. Yeah, and um, in, in this keynote, what I really want to do is actually just being the glue between um, a number of our customers that will be on stage and that will be talking to you about their journey to the cloud. Yeah, it's all about hearing from other customers and other users of the cloud about how to use AWS, because I think um, you know, that will be most powerful and you will learn most from those. Um, I want to start off first with talking a bit about how uh, the AWS business is progressing, and then talk about a few of the patterns that we see in usage uh, of AWS. So I think a really great, powerful number to show is that how uh, our Amazon S3, our storage service, is being used by our customers. Yeah, or next year, um, in the spring, uh, S3 will have its 10th birthday. And so as you can see, the data transfer in and out of uh, S3 is uh, incredibly growing. Yeah, between the fourth quarter in 2013 and that in 2014, it grew more than 100 percent, yeah, which is an amazing number. The same if you look at EC2, which is our compute service, yeah, in the two quarters, between those two quarters, you see that it's grown almost 100 percent, 93 percent. This is incredible growth, yeah, and especially because by now we have over a million customers making use of AWS on a monthly basis. Yeah, this is, these are incredible numbers. A million businesses are running on the cloud. And so very powerful numbers, I think. If you look at uh, uh, some of our startup customers, which are sort of the, uh, the fast growing, often all in customers on the cloud, like Tado, like I am, like SoundCloud, um, one football, one of my most favorite apps that I have on my phone. Um, all of them are running on AWS. Also, if you look at enterprises, yeah, the more, some of the well-known names here in, uh, in Germany, like uh, Kerger and uh, uh, Talanx or Merck, all making use of AWS uh, to run their business. Similar, just like Martin just told you, Public sector uh, is a very uh, fast-growing area uh, for, uh, for cloud usage, because every dollar they save, they can actually put it to good use. And so, for example, here in the uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, has been one of our earliest customers of, uh, of cloud usage. Well over 3,500 uh, educational institutions, universities, schools are making use of AWS and over 11,000 non-profit organizations. We couldn't do this, by the way, without our consulting partners. Yeah, they are very important for you because they will help you get onto the cloud. They have become experts in helping our customers become successful. Companies like TechRazor and CloudReach, who are all cloud-native companies, are helping you get onto the cloud. And we couldn't also do this without making sure that all traditional software packages or all new software packages are available for usage on the cloud. So Software AG and, and other companies, SAP here from Germany, are all supporting their software on AWS. And of course, you're growing very fast also internationally. Yeah, it is very important for you to be able to have one click of a button and be able to launch your software anywhere in the world whether your customers are in Japan, whether they're in Australia, uh, whether they're in South America. And I'm very happy to announce today that we've also are going to be launching a region in India, so that if you have your customers in India, you will be able to actually serve them for low latency. There's a traditional um, uh, analytics of uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, company, Gartner, actually, analyzes each year 
how cloud is being used and which companies are actually delivering the best service or are, or are executing really well with a visionary view. view. Uh, as you can see, AWS ranks up well up, well up high, um, you know, sort of alone and lonely, but I think we're fine being up there. So what you now see is that cloud has become the new normal. This is how you're being built. This is how your software is being built today. To be able to execute really well and really fast, you need to make, able to, you need to make use of the cloud, because otherwise you can no longer be competitive. So if you look at some of the patterns of this new normal, yeah, then first and foremost, you have to look at how are startups making use of the cloud. They are, of course, in a sort of luxury position, because they are allowed to move really fast because they have no legacy. Yeah, and so, and they can operate at a very low cost structure. And so they move really fast. And so, if you then look at it, it turns out that today's most brand names, most well-known brand names, are actually young businesses. Businesses that didn't exist four or five years ago. Yeah, if you look at companies like, uh, like Supercell over here in Germany, like Wuga, um, they had a new normal for gaming. Um, Dropbox is the well, most well-known name in storage to today. And Airbnb, yeah, a company that didn't exist five, six years ago, today, each night, 450,000 people are spending a night brokered in a room by Airbnb. This is incredible numbers. Every, every hotel chain would kill for those numbers. Yeah, so today, startups are able to be upsetting um, all the areas which you normally had to, to, was tra tra traditional. I would like to uh, actually invite on stage uh, Leopold from Bismarck, yeah, from Tado, to uh, talk about their journey to the cloud. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, Werner, for the kind introduction. It's very great to be here today. So um, I'm the MD at Tado. Um, we make uh, heating systems and AC smart. But um, let me start by walking you through a typical day of yours. So of course, um, after you brushed your teeth this morning, you stopped the water tap. It's quite clear, right? And it makes total sense to actually switch off the lights when you leave the room or the house. Most people do it, and I hope so. But in heating, it's a little bit different. Most people just let the heating run all day. About 85% of people let the heating run all day, no matter if they go to work, if they go on a weekend trip, it's nice and cozy at home, and energy is being wasted. And why is that? So first of all, it's kind of nice to come home, and it's nice and warm, right? But the thing is with heating, you can't just switch it on and it's warm. We can't overcome the laws of physics, and that's, that's a challenge. And so far, no tech company before Tado basically has uh, managed to, to address this problem in a really efficient, really good way. So that was actually the trigger for us to build the product that we call uh, the smart, uh, smart thermostat today. And you can see it on the uh, left side. It's kind of white, and it blends in with a wall. So um, it's actually meant to be um, not to get on, on your nerves, you know, because our uh, philosophy of tech is that it should be kind of humble in the background and working for you, kind of anticipating your behavior and offering comfort when it needs to. So it doesn't ask for your interaction all the time. There's the app on the other side, and it's really simple to set up. You can plug it in yourself, um, two wires coming out the wall, just put it, put it in the thermostat, set up the app, put it in your pocket, and you're good to go. The cool thing about Tato is that it works like a digital assistant in the background for you. So the core feature is um, that it's geo-based. That means when the last person has left the home, it'll start to lower the temperature so energy is being saved and um, without you having to press a button. And when the first person comes back home, it'll start to preheat so it's nice and comfortable when you arrive. And um, based on the um, distance from home, it'll know what the best away temperature is going to be because it knows that it has more time to heat up when you're kind of far away. Another cool thing about Tado, since it's uh, internet connected, is the capability to uh, include weather forecasts in its regulation. So um, if we know it's going to be a sunny day tomorrow, then it might make sense to actually start heating a little bit less today 
because when you have underflow heating, for example, it's kind of slow. When it actually starts to get cooler, the sun will take over. And that means we can avoid this kind of nasty overshooting of the inside temperature that you sometimes get, and also energy is being saved again. So um, another very cool aspect about having a connected boiler is that Tado will monitor your heating 24-7. We're connected to the uh, digital bus interface of your boiler, which means we get tons of data. We get error codes, we get uh, operational data from the boiler. Um, for example, is the pump working correctly? What is the temperature inside the system? Um, what is the water pressure? And um, if, if something's wrong, we will send you a notification. So first of all, um, we have to maintain uh, the connection to thousands of embedded devices. In the classical um, Tado home, you have the smart thermostat, you have a, a small gateway that you plug in your DSL router. And in some cases, you have a uh, extension kit that will be connected to the boiler. So it's uh, three embedded devices constantly in connection with our server infrastructure. And um, while all this is happening, while we're scaling this number, we need to be able to maintain an MVP culture and constantly deploying to our customers new features because we're creating a new category in the market. It's not a commodity. You know, Smart heating is not a commodity yet. So, what we do is we, we deploy fast, we look at how people use the product, and we iterate fast, fast, fast. And this is something that's really important to us, that we can focus on the product, on consumer experience, and not having to worry about infrastructure and maintaining uh, you know, a, a big team um, that, that's taking care of our service all the time. So obviously, this needs to be very reliable, very secure. Um, believe me, you don't want to be on the phone with someone at 4 in the morning when the heating is off in winter. It's not fun. So. One thing uh, that we've built on top of AWS is our machine-to-machine um, -machine gateway that we call Tado Ingress. So what Tado Ingress does, basically it takes all the messages coming from the devices and feeds them right into Kinesis where they are managed further. And um, we, we've done that building a custom co-app, um, basically maintaining open web sockets between the devices and the servers so we can go back and forth at any moment. This is a lot more flexible and a lot faster than the old HTTP response-driven model that we had before, where um, you know, the gateway had to um, ping the servers from the inside of the LAN and then receive a response from the server, no matter if there was a change in the app or not. So this is a lot more uh, efficient now. Um, and one of the core things we've, we've started using now is Lambda services. Um, what we're doing here is um, we've basically outsourced core algorithms from our core app and um, outsource them into Lambda services, which allows us to monitor subsets of different streams that we uh, receive from the boilers, from our devices, such as, for example, error codes. I um, spoke about Tato Care uh, with the installer earlier. So that means we have, for example, a Node.js script running on um, Lambda services, monitoring uh, the error codes of a certain boiler. And if there's a problem, we can push out a notification to the consumer offering self-help or offering an installer to fix the problem. Um, the core services we've moved to Docker uh, some time ago, also allowing for um, very flexible and zero downtime deployments, helping us to be fast again. And then, uh, yeah, last, last but not least, um, we work with a CloudWatch to monitor the machines and um, Kibana for um, our logging efforts, um, tons of data coming in, offering us a good way in a, you know, to, to um, handle this data in a very structured and very visual uh, way. So um, yeah, I hope this gave you a very brief overview of what we do at Tado and um, how AWS has managed to, to um, uh, contribute to our fast growth. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I can dance if you want to. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, amazing, amazing application, making use of all, um, all the advanced capabilities that AWS gives you. Not just making use of EC2, or not just making use of storage, but making use of Kinesis, making use of Lambda, um, VPC, the EC2 container service. All of these are very advanced uh, services that we've built. And so great kudos to the guys at Tado for actually really making use of every possible service um, that AWS offers. But it's not just for startups. Yeah? Today, as an enterprise, given the increasing competition, you need to move fast as well. Because otherwise, 
your competitors will pretty quickly show you their taillights. So it's important for enterprises as well to stay really fast and really fast moving. It is almost impossible today to be competitive and not be in the cloud. Yeah? No longer having to worry about deployment times, no longer having to worry about how long it will take for you to procure a server, uh, to get a server online, yeah? or actually to have to spend millions of dollars in hardware cost yeah, to be able to be scalable um, and to be able to move fast. So often we describe the old situation is that you're frozen in time because you're not really flexible. And to be competitive today, you need to be flexible and need to move fast. And so all the things that AWS gives you allows you to move fast, because that's what it's all about. And so many companies, many large enterprises, are making use of AWS today to actually be competitive. And whether it is uh, companies like Nokia or Philips, who is building a complete new platform to connect um, your devices and to connect large medical devices to the cloud to do the analytics there, whether it's Unilever that has moved over 1,700 websites over to AWS and is able now to move 75% faster with implementing new product websites. Um, but you know, don't take my word for it. Yeah? I'm very, very pleased that I'm able to introduce on stage Bettina Bernhardt from Audi to talk about Audi's journey to the cloud. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to everyone from my side also. I'm in my function as the MD of the Audi Business Innovation GmbH, LLC. I come back to that topic later. Um, looking for and after innovative topics uh, in the field of mobility and IT customer solutions. And a lot of things are moving for us, the maybe sometimes called old economy, the car industry and the mobility topic. If you just move in, um, and I know everyone experienced that maybe this morning also traffic, totally clearly linked to the car and to mobility, and additional, the information that 30% of the traffic is caused by drivers or cars that are looking for a parking spot. Okay, huge number. And what is happening since some years, the um, startup communities have a look at solutions. So you can name them. A lot of uh, startups come up with solutions that help the drivers to be much more quicker in that field and that affects totally and directly also us as a car manufacturer. So we experience a lot of changes. We have many new corporations or possible corporations out there. Two startups, we have a new competition out there. People who do not produce cars but look after mobility and um, some challenges coming out of that field. Additionally, the customers the drivers and users of our cars have a much higher amount for digital services and they want our product on demand always available. And therefore the car will be the next or the big service hub, which is an important part of our everyday life. In general, all the functions um, related to cars are based mainly on the smartphone and will be based on that tool much more. So you maybe book a car or just order a car, totally flexible via smartphone. You open the car via smartphone and you, and you uh, do re some functions related to the car over different tools. So we need a connection into um, different worlds so the car connects to many un other offers. For us, that means that we, apart from new cooperation possibilities, new competition, new technologies, and new demand for our customers, we will take a big step into different fields. Um, services is the big topic, and the car will be something that is just much more than we experience today. But nevertheless, we are one of the bigger companies, 
and we have dedicated processes and approaches related to the design, production and the sales processes of not a virtual product, but a real product. You can see it outside. And um, just to give you an insight, it takes us about five to seven years to bring a product from the first scratch to the market. So I think you're used to different ways of working. And um, we also have to integrate new developments into our normal way of working. And therefore, just um, especially for the topic mobility, we installed the Audi Business Innovation GmbH, a speedboat. And that is a step some of the big OEMs take at the moment just to move into quicker fields with the different processes with the um, entire entity. And we need this because otherwise we apply those processes which are very relevant for a complicated product like the car, but we need here a different kind of speed and also easier processes. As I said before, the car will move to the next step and the next step will be beyond the car and related to services and the experience of many other topics um, you wish you, ha you wish you have already, but in the next years they will definitely come. I just give you a quick insight in one of our products is Audi on Demand in the uh, nice town of San Francisco. Um, we just launched it end of April and um, we're looking after um, the customers who want to have much more flexibility in the usage of cars. So we placed a fleet of cars there, the whole range of Audi cars you could get. We make them um, book able via app and we have the whole technology, so forget about keys and everything, included in an app which you can order the car, not only buy, but you can open and close and start the car with. And um, you pick and choose whatever you like and um, you get the car delivered to the place you want. You could think, okay, it's a little bit of kind of um, rental cars. For us, it's a very big step into the flexible usage of our product and the integration of technology and innovation in um, very much offline product. There's more to come and we are working on five services in three countries at the moment. And this will be not only focused on one car sharing service, but the whole range um, which will be dedicated to different customer needs. Not every mobility service is, is um, relevant for every country worldwide. We are focused on um, quick scalability. So we check um, what are the customer needs in those countries and we have different customer groups also. So we have business customers, companies, and we have private customers. So these offers will um, be dedicated to them all and um, we use the innovative technologies, opening, closing the car, booking the cars via app, and we directly move into the field of, of digitalization, um, a new step for us. For example, Audi Unite um, launched end of last year as a pilot in Stockholm, a country or a city where you sometimes hassle to drive or own a car. So we give the customers the possibilities up to five customers to share a car. And that's really car sharing because you know you, the, the friends or the, the guys you, you uh, share the car with. And also the costs are shared, the parking lots are shared. So um, it will be a big contribution for bigger cities to think beyond normal ownership of the cars. So how did we do that? Um, as I said, new entity, and we um, hired many specialists from, from different branches. So um, totally different and partly those we didn't have in our company yet. So we installed not only new people and new uh, ideas, but also a new structure. That means we skipped the traditional uh, department structure we have in a bigger company. We placed everything around IT and uh, people are working together on one product right from the beginning with a very important new, um, let's say, main part, the IT part. 
That maybe doesn't sound um, rocket science for you, but uh, for us, it was a very, very big step and um, also important to gain speed and also to have a close contact to the customer. So design thinking is nothing new. Um, but to put the customer in the center of all our activities also means to take the feedback of the customer very quickly into the process. So we do that with the small teams and also beta phase. We, we launched uh, what you saw there, Audi On Demand in San Francisco as a beta product and we collect the feedback of the customers and directly put it in our products. That's not typical for us because every car you see outside is perfectly developed. There is no beta product outside. It's a 120% product. So we definitely here need also to change the approach because we, we go out and know not 100% maybe all the IT processes are fixed because we need the feedback of the customers for that. So speed is essential. Um, also something new for, for us, uh, the agile development and an advantage um, in, to be in the cooperation of a big group, we use all the synergies we could get within uh, the Audi group. We scale and roll out the products you just saw quickly worldwide. This is also something new for us because at the same time we launch products in different countries. That's how we use the Amazon Web Services for because we need a very fast scalability and also at the same time we need local data uh, because otherwise the opening and the closing of the cars for example won't via app won't be possible additionally we also need um, enough space for our developers to be close to the data and also to have enough compute testing capacity also something which was one of our biggest requirements for uh, the platform we work with and which we are offered now via AVS. I think this is also crystal clear. We need zero downtime and uh, that is a prerequisite for our services and customer services world worldwide. And um, additionally, uh, we use certain parts um, of the Amazon Web Services, which I mention in detail. Um, first of all, it's the virtual um, private cloud, cloud where we uh, store the customer data in um, due to our IT security standards, which are quite high and where we have, a, as a German company, a very high importance on. Um, then the multi-availability uh, zones is very important for us for speed and reliability. And uh, additionally, the Elastic Compute Cloud, which um, we definitely need to scale also the capacities or the compute capacities and also have the possibility to downscale in off times. So these are important parts for, for our mobility products. Um, just a quick overview what we are doing, how we're using AWS. And um, I can tell you there's more to come. Uh, more services worldwide with a higher speed, and we're looking forward to that. And um, I wish you to have a nice day today and uh, a nice um, talk to different branches. So if you have questions, you can approach afterwards to me. Welcome to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love the analogy or that a company has to become like a speedboat. Yeah, because really, to be competitive today, you have to move fast. And so it's not just a matter of um, you know, procuring services really fast. You know, you actually, what we hear from our customers is that they like the fact that we have so much more available than just compute and storage. Yeah, if it's not just a matter of that, you can procure services, you can provision services, not, no longer in a matter of weeks, but actually in a matter of seconds, but also that we have many different services available for you to use. Yeah, it is beyond storage and compute. This is actually where most of the other providers are still are, just storage, compute, and databases. But if you look at all the services that AWS has available for you, we have well over 45 different services available for you. And whether that is in the area of analytics, 
whether it's in the area of helping you develop and deploy, whether you want to develop mobile services. Um, we also have a range of application services available, such as virtual desktops, um, work mail, collaboration services, and so also a whole range of what I would call people services. Yeah? We offer you support, we offer you solution architects, we have professional services available for you. All of these together, this whole smorgasbord or sondagsbraten mit alle, what was it? Alle bijlagen. <laughs> yeah. um, that we have available for you. And so this wide variety of services makes that you actually can really focus on developing the applications that you need, that you want to develop. And we're, we're moving really fast here as well. We're taking a similar approach to building um, sort of minimal viable products, or we, when we launch new services, yeah, we actually bring them in your hands really quickly. And then take your feedback and really quickly deliver new features and new services around it. Which means that if you look at the past years, or last year, well over 500 new major features and services were delivered to you. All driven by feedback from you, our customers, so that we develop exactly that what we need to develop to help you be successful. It's also the case, of course, that many of your workloads, they're not identical. There is no sort of minimal viable workload that everybody can, uh, can use. Often, you know, the very, free, very different types of workloads require also very different type of infrastructure pieces. And as such, yeah, take for example the different EC2 instances that we have available for you, whether it is compute driven, whether it's IO driven, whether it's disk, or whether you need GPUs, all of these different features and services are available for you and make you be successful. It's also the case that it's easy for you to make mistakes. Yeah, in the past, if you had bought a server, you spent $100,000 on it, yeah, and it turned out that your application wasn't compute driven, but that was IO driven, you were in a big mess. Today, with AWS, the only thing you have to do is push a button and you get a different instance type available to you. Also, in terms of storage, yeah, we have a wide variety of storage services available for you. Also, to support each and every one of the type of workloads that you have. Do you need object storage? Do you need block storage? Do you need archiving? All of these are available for you to use. And it helps our customers to move fast in the digital age. And I'd like to invite uh, on stage uh, Inka Dreugemuller from uh, um, the Museum Stadel to talk about how their move from, uh, from analog to digital is happening. Thank you. Hello. My name is Inka Drögemüller and I'm proud to be here today on behalf of the Stedel Museum, Germany's oldest and most renowned museum foundation. Exactly 200 years ago, in 1815, the banker and businessman Johann Friedrich Stedel established the Stedel Museum as a civic foundation. As he expressed it in his will, his comprehensive collection of paintings and engravings and his entire fortune were to be applied to the benefit of the city of Frankfurt and its citizens. Over the past 200 years, Thanks to our active acquisition policy and the ongoing dedication of our partners, sponsors and supporters, this collection has undergone constant expansion. Today, it offers an almost uninterrupted overview of 700 years of European art, from the early 14th century to the Renaissance, the Baroque, the classical modern, and the very present. Our holdings comprise altogether approximately 3,000 paintings, 600 sculptures, 4,000 photographs, and more than 100,000 drawings and prints. Among the highlights are works by the old masters, such as Lucas Cranach, Albrecht Dürer, Botticelli, 
Rembrandt and Vermeer, by modern artists, for instance, Monet and Picasso, and by such prominent contemporaries as Gerhard Richter or Neo Rauch. Every year, we show these and other works in our permanent collection and in internationally acknowledged exhibitions, which are accompanied by a diverse program of events and museum education activities, designed for a broad target group guided by the motto, every visitor is different, and so is every visit. Following the structural extension of the museum in 2012, this year, the Städel is celebrating its bicentennial. We are taking our 200th anniversary as an occasion to redefine our wide-ranging educational offers and expand the museum experience into the digital rearm. In times of the century overload produced by the media, the museum is an asynchronous space that, more than ever, offers a means of temporary retreat from the fast pace of everyday life. In a museum, you concentrate better, you are better able to conduct dialogues, and you are capable of focusing deliberately on the perception of one or more artworks. And in fact, the average time visitors spend at a museum has not changed since 1960, even in the age of the limited attention span. On the other hand, in view of the comprehensive phenomenon of digitalization, the museum world and its self-image face fundamental changes and new challenges. It is precisely there that we see enormous potential for several reasons. Of the more than 100,000 works in our collection, only 1% can be displayed, the rest is in storage. What is more, there is naturally a limit to our building's capacity to receive visitors. This is where the expansion of the museum into the digital rearm offers us entirely new possibility. We can not only make a large proportion of the collection accessible, but also open it up to a broader public, above and beyond spatial and temporal boundaries. Whereas the number of visitors is leveling off at between 400 and 500,000, the number of users of our offers, of our digital offers, is increasing at a rapid pace and is, and is expected to rise at an ever fast rate in the future. At the moment, more than one million persons take advantage of our digital offers every year, in other words, twice the number of visitors to the museum. So our new digital projects, of which we have already launched several just this year, we are rising to these challenges and offering our visitors an even more comprehensive and more individual experience of art and the museum. With these projects, we can also transcend Tem temporal and spatial boundaries in making the results of our research, our education and mediation activities, and our collection accessible to an even broader target group. One of our most outstanding projects is a cloud-based multimedia platform, the Städel Digital Collection. On this platform, some 600 artworks and more than 52,000 informational items are presently at the user's disposal. Apart from large-scale illustrations and texts, each artwork is also accompanied by audio sequences, video clips, or information on the work's exhibition history. The structure and front end of the digital collection are designed in such a way as to inspire the user and call his attention to possible connections between the works. Anyone who embarks on what we call digital roaming can discover and acquaint himself with the artworks in the collection from a wide range of different perspectives. What is more, the digital collection offers users individual access to the collection and its contents. 
whereas the layperson will presumably enjoy clicking his way through the digital collection intuitively. Thanks to the tagging of the pictorial contents, the scholar can set out an entirely different and much more specific type of search. Users can moreover create albums with their favorite works and share them on various social media channels. After all, exchange and unrestricted communication are the main objectives of our platform. With the digital collection, we are thus offering expanded access to our works in terms of content and narrative. Yet with this project, we would also like to reach persons who, for reasons of spatial distance or other barriers, have never been to the Städel, but love art and would enjoy exploring the wide range of contents provided by our platform. For the site's further development, we have launched the beta version which invites users to collaborate actively and contribute their comments. They can get involved in shaping both the content-related orientation of the digital collection and the platform's functionality, and thus make a contribution to its constant expansion and enhancement. Of the 110,000 works in our collection, 600 have been entered into the digital collection, along with 52,000 informational items, 490 audio tracks, and more than 80 film productions. The semantic processing of the data has given rise to a rich content pool with up to 137 texts for each individual work. The works are complexly connected to one another by way of tagging. These interlinks lure the user to roam the digital collection actively in search of ever new discoveries. By the end of this year, digital collection users will have access to more than 1,500 works, as well as further information, which will also be available in English. In addition, more than 22,000 drawings will be digitalized and tagged by 2018 and then also make their way, their way into the digital collection. AWS helps us to set up our numerous web services quickly and flexibly, thus reducing the effort we have to invest in managing our digital projects. The minimum of technical maintenance couple, coupled with the ability to scale our digital projects to the maximum are what constitute the great advantages of using AWS to serve our purposes as a museum. This tool also enables us to realize our digital expansion goals and focus on the core aspects of our museum work. In the long run, it will not be technical limitations we run into, but merely the boundary set by the number of works in our collection. The large-scale digital initiatives and free offers are ultimately no substitute for a visit to the museum. On the contrary, they represent a supplemental art mediation offer because the sustainably structured, sensible utilization of digital possibilities allows the museum to expand its radius of action and impact to a whole new scale. The digital projects make it possible for us to develop innovative educational offers ourselves. And we, as a nonprofit organization, play a leading role in cultural education and mediation, rather than leaving these offers only to commercial providers. By making intelligent use of the potentials offered by the advancing digital developments, we are paving the way for the future of the museum as an institution and the Städel's next 200 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's actually absolutely mind-blowing what Stable has done. Yeah? Making not, just, not just making things available in a, in a digital form, but enriching the content dramatically, especially food tagging. Um, thank you for... Uh, for talking to us about that. 
It is, I, I talked about this earlier, you know, we have such a wide variety of different storage options available for you. But it turns out that there are actually a number of use cases that were not really well served by the offerings that we have. And one of them is uh, uh, access to a shared file system. Yeah? In, with all the other options we have, there's still a lot of traditional software that just requires to have a file system available. And many of our customers actually implemented this themselves by running their own NFS servers, using EBS, uh, but they were not really well served by it. Because it's actually really hard to, uh, to implement a shared file system, especially if you need to be scalable, if you need to really implement them uh, reliably. All of these things were really hard. So it was a big missing building block in our offering. And so we decided to launch, uh, to build a new service for you called the Amazon Elastic File System. Yeah, it is a managed service that provides you a shared file system. And as usual, you know, this has all the capabilities that you expect of an AWS service. Yeah, it is fully managed. You can load them into EC2. It can grow to any scale, petabytes, if that's what you want. It is actually running on SSDs, which means that you have a very, um, I should say, guaranteed performance um, out of it. And it is, of course, highly available because we replicate this to multiple availability zones, which means that if you want to access it from other instances that you're running in other availability zones, you get the same low latency. It's very easy to create. You just push one button in the console, and you can create a file system. Um, it supports NFS version 4. Um, and as usual, there's no upfront cost uh, to, to apply. You only pay for what you've used. And you only pay, actually, for the storage costs that you have. And so it is really scalable, supports any type of workload that you should expect for a shared file system. And it is available for you right now. Yeah, if you can sign up for the preview at uh, this URL. And data usage is absolutely increasing. Yeah, it's never been easier than now to actually collect, store, analyze, and share data. Yeah, we have many options available in each and every one of those dimensions. How do you actually move your data into the cloud? Where do you generate it? What kind of storage options do you, do you have available? And different types of uh, analytic tools available for you as well. Yeah, we have a wide variety of services available for you to actually do exactly what you need to do with your analytics. And analytics is actually something that is increasing in terms of usage. Yeah, we have a wide variety of customers that are making use of our analytics services. Take, for example, FINRA, which is a, um, a public sector company in, in the US that monitors uh, market data. And so they ingest on a daily basis well over 30 billion uh, market events and do, and do analytics on them based on S3 and Elastic Map Reduce. But there's all sorts of different data-driven um, operations. Yeah? One of them, of course, traditionally, is all about reporting. But what we also see, there's an increasing usage in sort of real-time dashboarding. And whether that is about system events or whether that is uh, sort of more higher level application events that are being analyzed in real time and presented to, um, to their users. We see a third category arising that is becoming increasingly important, which is to be able to make predictions. Yeah, how can you use data from the past to build a predictive ser service? And so we see more and more of that happening. Traditionally, of course, you all know about recommendations. Recommendations are, are a form of predictions. And Amazon.com itself already used uh, these uh, sort of prediction services for a long time. Yeah? If you go onto the site, we'll provide you with recommendations, which are a form of predictions. How do you do this? You do this by technologies called machine learning. Yeah, it's one form of AI that is, uh, that is becoming increasingly important. And so how, do you, how have you done this within Amazon is actually to provide our users, with, uh, our engineers, with a service called the Simple Machine Learning Service. That was what we built for ourselves internally. What we saw when we've built this service is an increasing fast usage of prediction technology. 
Yeah, and that can be whether it's counterfeit good detection, whether it's abusive review detection, all of these kind of things are based on what's called machine learning. Now we've actually produced this as an AWS service as well. So now you have machine learning services available for everybody else to use. And it makes it really simple. It's simple to find patterns in data and use that then to build a service that you can actually query. It's been always really hard to actually make use of machine learning because there's so many different things you need to know about. You need to know about algorithms, you need to know about feature detection, you need to know about what kind of data sets to use. And so we've decided to make it really simple for you to actually start using machine learning. There's a large opportunity, I think, available for building these sort of predictive services. And so it's very easy now for you to actually create machine learning models and to do that visually. It's uh, very easy also to actually not only do this in batch processing, but to actually use this in real time. There's a, a wide variety of inputs that you can use into the, uh, into the machine learning service, and you get a visual environment that you can use. So you start off with doing a, uh, um, we're starting to begin to decide what are sort of the different bins that you want to use. Then you can actually make use of a visual interface to determine um, how, what level of accuracy and what level, level of uh, false positives and negatives um, are, are you willing to accept. And very cool then is that you can actually turn that into a real-time service with one click of a button meaning that once you've trained the data set, you can turn it into a service that you can use to actually ask questions to. Yeah, so for example, if this would be a fraud detection service, then you can actually, whenever you get an order coming in, you can actually ask this model to say what is the likelihood that this is a fraudulent order or not. Um, it's available for you to use right now. Another pattern that we see is that you have to move really fast and as such, you need to have a wide variety of services available to you. Yeah, in 2006, we only had one uh, machine type available for you, one instance type. Right now, we have seven instance types available for you, and within each of those families, we have a, a wide a variety of sizes that you can use, from small to large. But what we see is that there is an interest in actually starting to use much smaller building blocks. Instance types already were, in my eyes, containers, because they are things that you can start and stop and destroy um, with a click of a button. But we see an interest in actually much smaller building blocks, uh, where the output of your development process is a container by itself. And as such, we've launched a new service called the Amazon EC2 Container Service that makes it very easy for you to take Docker um, images and run them and place them over multiple availability zones. Also, you can make use of Beanstalk with the container service to uh, really make it easy to lay out how your application should look like, what are the different components that are in there, and with a click of a button to launch an application uh, consisting of multiple containers over multiple availability zones. Uh, this service is now generally available. It's available also with uh, CloudTrail integration, meaning that you can really track exactly what are the changes that have been made to your application. And it also makes it much easier to, uh, to actually build this in multiple availability zones. I often look at uh, sort of these fine-grained container services as a sort of Tetris game. Yeah, so you can have these multiple building blocks that, uh, that make up your application and the scheduler will take care of placing them over multiple availability zones over the EC2 instances that are available to you. And so what you see is that you can dynamically extend these applications, and also, which I think is really important, you can actually update, um, update these containers with a click of a button. Yeah, what you really end up with is what I would call uh, an immutable infrastructure. Because what you do is, instead of patching software, what you do is you just create a new container um, instance as an output of your development process and just swap them in and out of different versions. 
And so we also launched a new uh, scheduler for you, so that it makes it easy to integrate that with ELB, the Elastic Load Balancer, and to place it over multiple availability zones. But actually, what we see is that there was an interest in actually being even finer grained than these con containers. What people really want, what you really want, is actually no longer to have to think about EC2 instances or about containers. And so we, we launched something called AWS Lambda, which means that you can just write functions and drop them in the cloud and without having to think about where, where they have to run. And so initially, we launched this as an event-driven service. Yeah, where in response to events that were happening, some Lambda function was being triggered. You can also now, with a new toolkit, actually make synchronous applications, synchronous calls into Lambda. I think this is one of the coolest things that we have ever built, because you no longer need to think about where, where your code is running. You just write some code, drop it somewhere, and it will run automatically by itself. And it's going to be a, a very extensive service being used by all sorts of different tools. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, but we just launched also a, uh, a voice toolkit uh, where it is also integrated with Lambda. Well, Lambda is the, the, uh, the standard way of developing new code. So you can actually have a voice string and then we automatically have some code being triggered if that, uh, if that voice string is being executed. So there's a, there's a, again, there's a variety of different usage patterns that we see. Uh, for one of them is, uh, for example, indexing. So you could have someone dropping an image in Amazon S3, and then automatically a function is being triggered that, that reads that image, image, retrieves the metadata from the image, and then stores that in DynamoDB. And we have customers building very extensive architectures. This one is, uh, for example, from a company called AdWell, who have lots of, who do uh, ad retargeting. So that needs to happen really quickly. So if customers have visited the website, the data is being dropped in S3, automatically Lambda function is being triggered that replicates then that data out into multiple, multiple regions, actually, around the world. It's also being used for, by many of our customers um, that are focused on doing mobile development. So basically, you can write your Lambda functions, and automatically, Lambda function can be triggered from your mobile device. It's also that we started off with actually offering Lambda in, uh, in JavaScript only, but now you can also actually write these, uh, these cloud functions in Java. And indeed, we see a wide variety of, of these kinds of users. Um, and so what we have now is a very extensive set of services uh, available for, for, for you, whether it's containers, whether it's cloud functions, whether it is um, just regular instance types, variety of storage options for you available as, as well. I'd like to introduce to the States Eric Bowman from uh, Zalando, who is going to talk about their usage of cloud services. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. It's great to uh, see so many people, and I uh, really appreciate your time. Um, I'm Eric Bowman. I'm VP of Engineering at Zalando. And uh, over the past uh, about almost a year, we've really gone quite a big change at Zalando, uh, almost a revolution internally to hugely increase the speed of our development and to kind of rediscover what it's like to be a startup again. And AWS has been a huge part of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about Zalando. I, I suspect most people know what Zalando is. In fact, I feel like half the people I've met here used to work there. Um, in just seven years, we've grown hugely to over 8,000 people. Uh, we did $2.2 billion in revenue last year. It's been an amazing success story, uh, one of the fastest growing companies in European history. We went public last year. We sell a lot of stuff, and we have a reasonably sized engineering team, about 400 engineers, close to 800 technologists. And this year, we've uh, started to make the move to AWS. And it's been going very, very well and very quickly. And we're going to talk a little bit about the path that we've gotten there by. And it starts with something that we call radical agility. Radical agility is 
something that we introduced to figure out how to scale our team, to move fast, to continue to innovate, and to basically continue to feel like a startup even as we get bigger and bigger. Um, radical agility is a combination of techniques that we've discovered and borrowed from lots of companies around the world. We followed what works and what doesn't work, and we tried to make something that works well for us as we start on kind of the next business adventure, which is building a platform to uh, revolutionize how people connect with fashion. Radical agility is a combination of how we organize people and teams and how we organize and build systems. It combines a lot of things that are, I think, sort of common uh, in the blogosphere. Conway's Law is a big deal to us. System theory is a big deal to us. And we try to think about how to organize teams so that they can actually move fast and how to organize systems so that those systems leverage things like Conway's Law and we can move as fast as our business needs us to. <clears throat> the first part of this is around giving teams purpose. A lot of times what happens in traditional companies with lots of hierarchy is that tech teams end up being just sort of the IT department and they get lots of tickets and they do lots of little pieces of work. And when you're trying to hire and retain the best engineers in the world, that just isn't good enough. And so we've created the context to allow teams to really focus on not how they're building things, but really why they're building things. And this frees up the best minds to work on the problem at hand and to really think and be creative and take total ownership end to end of what they're building. With purpose also comes the need for autonomy. The best people want to work in an, an autonomous way. And freeing up good people to solve problems using the tools that they want to use in the way that they think is best is incredibly important to getting the best out of them, keeping them happy, and having them love what they do. And AWS is a huge part of this for us. It gives us a ton of freedom around how teams can work, how teams can build, the tools that they use, the languages that they use, and frees them up to make the decisions relative or, or, with respect to the problems that they're solving and not worrying about lots of details around infrastructure and process. The third component is around mastery and giving people the freedom and the space to learn what we need them to learn. So this field is moving so fast and there's a lot to learn just to use AWS and there's a lot to learn from AWS. AWS is an amazing set of tools that are so well thought out and so well engineered. And we really give our teams a lot of space and time to learn not only how to use AWS, but also to learn how to build complex distributed applications that have massive throughput, high performance, high availability, and are just incredibly complex. And this takes the ability to learn, the desire to learn, and we really only are looking for people who want to keep learning, and we are all continuously learning. The final piece of radical agility is around trust. So Zalando really is built on the basis of trusting employees, and it's, for me, an amazing place to work as a result. And with radical agility, what we're doing is building a system where people can be trusted. So there's a strong focus on teams, and we think of teams as a unit of trust. And being on a team grants you access to different things automatically, and we've tried to create the context where people can make mistakes and it's not, a, not fatal, where people have the freedom to do what they need to do to see the data that they need to see when they see it without going through a long, complex approval process. And all of the, the idea of trust underpins everything, and it's incredibly important to trust our people. Radical agility isn't just about how we organize teams and the sort of philosophy around people, but it also embraces some important ideas around architecture that have proven to be incredibly important to both moving fast and containing complexity. So at the end of the day, complexity is the biggest enemy in building systems. And almost everything that we do and everything that we think about is how to manage and contain this complexity. So we started with the idea of going API first. We have hundreds of services already, and those, the APIs between those services are incredibly important. And for years, people have been talking about APIs, but in practice, it's been fairly hard to be thorough about defining APIs. 
We're using Swagger, which has emerged, I think, as kind of a best-in-breed tool for doing this. And we're actually focusing a lot of it energy on defining APIs and reviewing them internally and learning together how to do this well. We're also using REST, which is, of course, nothing terribly new. But REST, the idea behind REST really is how to upgrade APIs and systems without breaking. In fact, if you look at what Roy Fielding was trying to do, he was trying to upgrade the internet without breaking it. And we see the systems that we build as being essentially like the internet itself. And we've embraced REST quite heavily. We're also building systems in a software as a service style. The reason for this is not just so that we can spin off services as individual businesses, but really it's about managing complexity. As systems grow big, what we've seen in a few different places is that people tend to have these shared binary dependencies between systems. And over time, that dependency graph becomes incredibly complex. And it becomes harder and harder to move fast. So by actually having very hard splits between our systems, we can decouple them. We can leverage REST and strong APIs and build systems that can move fast in parallel without breaking. We've also embraced microservices, which are really primarily about managing complexity. Um, something like 40 years ago in the mythical man month, uh, Fred Brooks pointed out that they really had discovered a sweet spot around complexity where a module around 400 lines of code actually had the lowest bug density. And uh, as the code got either smaller or bigger, the, the complexity went up, particularly as it gets bigger. Microservices also allow our teams to move fast, and it allows us to move the tech stack forward. If you're not doing microservices, and you probably shouldn't if you're just starting out, but you'll, you end up with monoliths. And those monoliths get incredibly complex. And it becomes harder and harder to make changes and harder and harder to move fast. And we're doing all of this on AWS, which solves one of the biggest problems for us. If you're not using the cloud, resources are something that you have to fight for. Getting new hardware, particularly when you're growing quickly, can take weeks. Sometimes at the last minute, something more important comes along, and they take your hardware away. And all of this has this subtle pressure on the architecture of your system, where people will just keep adding features to existing code bases and existing deployed systems, making those code bases bigger and bigger and harder and harder to change and test over time. We saw this firsthand, and we're now taking it apart. And it's amazing to see how fast we can move as a result. Ultimately, for us, AWS is about leverage. It was not the easiest thing to get Zalando to look at AWS, because we are competing with Amazon. But when you actually look at the thousands of man years of engineering effort that have gone into building AWS, and the quality of the APIs, the stability of the system, the performance of the system, it's really hard to argue with that. And after looking carefully at it, we made this decision toward the end of last year that we would make this move, and it has been kind of amazing. I want to talk a little bit about something that we've done, which we're opening, open sourcing, called Stups. Um, because we're a company that really likes to build things, it was hard to not start building things around how to use AWS. And what we've built with Stups is really quite amazing. And I would encourage all of you, if you're thinking about rolling out AWS to a kind of a medium-sized enterprise to have a look. What we've done is given each team its own AWS account, which we think is not a terribly common pattern. And there are some real challenges around how to do that. But what that lets us do is solve some very hard security problems and some very hard auditing and compliance problems, which we don't think anyone else is doing as well as we're doing. Ships is really has hit a really sweet spot in terms of allowing developers freedom to move fast, full access to the systems that they need, while not compromising on the ability to audit the entire system in near real time on demand. Whether it's a simple internal tool or a most demanding PCI compliant applications, everything works the same. And it's a very, very straightforward set of tools to get up and moving with great security, total audit compliance, and total freedom for teams. Strips leverage is Docker. It has a mechanism for granting on demand people SSH access to the systems that their team has access to, is allowed to have access to. 
and it's continuous, continuously generating audit reports in real time using CloudTrail and uh, an instrumented AMI. But it gives teams full access to their account. All of the AWS tools they can just use, it just works. It totally leverages and integrates with everything in AWS already. But it brings a lot more, and it's very opinionated about allowing radical agility and lots of teams to work fast in parallel. So that is uh, all I have on this topic. We are, of course, hiring. And we're writing a lot about what we're doing. We've opened up quite a lot in the last year. And uh, Stups is great. And I really encourage you to have a look. And thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, thank you very much for making Stups available for everyone to, to use. Um, key part, of course, in what we just talked about is about security. Yeah, and I think we cannot talk today about the cloud and not talk about security. Yeah, because I think the way that we've developed our tools makes that our security in the cloud is stronger than that you would ever be able to achieve in an on-premise environment. Yeah, security will be forever our number one priority. It is also our number one investment area. We continue to not only build out our operational security, but also develop new tools for you to use, such that at a very fine grained level, you can protect the applications that you're running in the cloud. And it is not only that we actually do this on a, in a physical secure environment. Yeah? Our data centers are completely locked down. I cannot even enter one of our data centers. Yeah? It is we give you the absolute strongest security there, but also we give you a lot of tools to actually give you insight into how your services are being used. Yeah, CloudTrail gives you the ability to, at a very detailed level, exactly know what operations are being done on your services, by who, under which con conditions. Of course, we have the broader set of accreditations um, and compliance available for you. Yeah. Also, all these audit reports are available for you as customers to inspect whether we actually are meeting the requirements uh, that, you, that you have. It's also the case that because of the broadness of our platform, the wide variety of types of customers that we have, we've built um, uh, security tools that are really the highest end security tools that you can imagine. It means that every company on our platform immediately has access to the absolute best security tools. And you can imagine that if we've built these things for, for Shell or for Unilever or for BP, that the, who have the highest requirements in terms of security, all these tools become available for all of our customers to use. So you have the benefit of a network effect in building very high-end security tools that which allow you to actually protect your business. It is also the case that you are the only one who decides who has access to your data under all conditions. Yeah, we've given you, for example, as part of these, uh, these security tools, the ability to encrypt your data and to manage your keys very easily. If you encrypt your data, if you encrypt your critical business data or personal identifiable information that you are storing of your customers, you are the only one who decides who has access to your data by managing your keys correctly. We take part, we take um, care of one part of the security, yeah? but also we give you the tools to make sure that you can actually protect your data and your applications. And I've always said that in sort of the old style of security, everything is related to sort of firewalls. But we know already that firewalls are not an effective way of protecting your systems. You actually have to protect each application by itself. So we do this by locking down everything. It is up to you to open up access to your applications. At a very fine grained level, you can determine who has access to your data under which con conditions. Of course, we, um, we, are, um, we make use of 
uh, we provide you the security that uh, all the EU data protection laws are, are requiring of us. Uh, even to the point that, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch Central Bank has approved AWS for retail banking. And our first customers are moving over to the cloud there um, uh, using a platform called Open. We also make sure that all these EU data protection laws apply also if you would move your data outside of regions here in the EU. We have a wide variety of security tools available for, for you, whether it's virtual private cloud that allows you to cordon off a piece of the cloud for yourself, assign your own uh, addressing blocks to it, and manage the network completely, whether it's identity and access control, or CloudTrail, which is our auditing service, um, the key management service that allows you to manage your security keys or your, uh, your encryption keys in the, in the cloud. All of these services are available for all of you to, to, to use. We also recently launched something called uh, VPC flow logs that allow you at a detailed level see exactly what kind of network operations have been, um, are going on in your virtual private cloud. Many of our customers have, of course, already an existing environment. Yeah? And so in the past, there's been the idea that, you, uh, that cloud would be a binary decision. Either you move everything to the cloud or you keep everything on premise. But that's not going to be reality. Reality is going to be that you will be running things on premise and you will be actually running things in the cloud combined. And so we've built then a whole wide variety of tools for you to actually manage both your systems on premise as well as in the, in the, in the cloud. And so whether we have, uh, for example, uh, Ops, with OpsWorks as well with Code Deploy can operate both in the cloud as well as on premise. Um, direct Connect allows you to actually bypass the general internet and build a direct MPLS connection into the cloud. Also, making use of, uh, for example, if you have VMware images that you're running on premise, we give you automatic tools to translate that, that images from a VMware image into an AMI, the Amazon machine image, or the other way around. If you have built an AMI, it gives you the tools to actually automatically create a VMware image out, out, out of that. And while we have built all these tools for you to actually make it easy for you to run both things on-premise as well as in the cloud, now we have a strong conviction that this is not the end point. Yeah? Over time, more and more, uh, companies will have less and less data centers. And more and more of these services will start running in the cloud. There's also a wide variety of customers, actually, that have gone all in. That's definitely another pattern that we see. You might be a well-known uh, bold move in early in 2009 was from Netflix. Netflix was a DVD shipping company that wanted to become uh, the world's best video streaming service. And for that, they realized that they have to put all their engineering effort in being this absolute best streaming service and not have to worry about the infrastructure that it takes to run such a video streaming service in a worldwide business. Infor is another company that actually builds um, high-end enterprise services. And <laughs> Charles Phillips did this great, great comment where he says, friends don't let friends build data centers anymore. And so there's a wide variety, a whole set of customers that have gone all in now. For example, here in Germany, the well-known hotel chain Kapinski has this made the decision to move all in into the cloud. But also banks like uh, Suncorp in Australia or um, financial services companies like Intuit are all moving all in into the cloud. Another very important uh, group of customers are those coming out of the, um, the, the public sector. Of course, every dollar that you can save in the public sector can be applied for good. An important set of our customers there, as I showed earlier on the slide, is actually universities. I would like to uh, invite uh, Professor Kregmar on stage to talk about their use of cloud services. 
Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. You might wonder why universities and uh, what is there in terms of cloud services uh, for education? Well, if I look into the room and I look at the digital transformation uh, as the next thing, you are quite a number, but you're just not enough. There's more people that uh, the companies that you have heard would like to hire. So I'm here in two roles. One is the role of a worldwide association of information systems academics, about 4,000 all over the world, 90 countries. And we worry how can we best educate young people to grow the area uh, that builds in new applications. And the second one is to report to you some experiences that we have done as one of the university competence centers, uh, Technical University of Munich. So yes, the um, notion is to really go ahead very fast. And um, if you look at that, what we have heard in the last hours, it's about learning by doing. Uh, you expect to try out. We talked about agility. We talked about learning from that. And if you usually look at this picture, well, probably you might concentrate on the kids as usual. I'd like to concentrate on the person with the hat, uh, the one that is actually riding in front of the two others, because it's this uh, role of the teachers uh, that might inspire you. And uh, a little help from a friend that didn't let you build a data center, but that helped you to actually jump and said, well, it'll be fine. It'll probably hurt or even not. And if you do it 10 times, you'll probably have it done. Um, it was really helpful. And the precondition to do that, actually, is to make sure that the pool, once you land there, doesn't look like that. Um, so what do teachers actually need to be able to inspire you and give you the confidence uh, that you jump? Because teaching and researching ITIS topics requires really an up-to-date software and IT infrastructure. If I look at many of the public institutions, universities, uh, institutions of higher education, teachers are probably my age, old. And the infrastructure they have is old. They don't have a lot of investment. So what is a possible uh, solution for that? A possible solution would be to reuse the ready-to-use IT infrastructures according to the needs of the educational uh, institutions. But if you look, just look at the infrastructure, and you take uh, Werner's description of all the new services that AWS has, that's not that easy to teach. Because um, as Eric told us, uh, he needs a team that is really learning stuff. And if you look at the average teacher's day at 20 hours to teach in the week, you would love to have the mastery, but they are fully versed with grading. So we have to make their life easier. And that's exactly uh, what, we're trying, uh, what we're trying to do. Because education as a service actually applies all of this. It implies that you have access to a cloud service and the infrastructure is there. But that's basically the pool. You need to fill that with teaching materials that are also enticing. And you also need to be able uh, to have supporting services. Remember, the business of teaching in universities is done on a 13-week schedule, Tuesday and Thursday, if I have my lecture today with students. The next one is Thursday, and if I run into a problem, I need to have it solved by Thursday. Otherwise, you start to doubt whether you really want to jump just because your inspiring teacher invites you to jump into that pool. So we actually have to fill um, the pool with water. Looks like that. Um, yes, now you concentrate on the pool and the water in there. I concentrate on the service ecosystem around it because there's probably people that watch the pool. There are people that are actually keep the garden nice, that have built the buildings around, that give you the ticketing services. So if you really put that together, then you actually have a lot of number of service modules, educational service providing, we call that. And uh, if you look at that, you can provide that, and we see that in two different ways where uh, these services are actually rendered. One is an education platform, like uh, SAP University Alliances does now, like Amazon Web Services Educate provides. That type of uh, service provides you some teaching content from other teachers and professors. It allows you to have a collaboration portal, community forum, and training and technical support. All that needs to be available to entice the teachers to be the inspiring ones that we actually need. Um, at TU Munich in uh, the SAP University Competence Center, we add a little more. We build actual curricula, ready to use services where teachers can tell us we need a 10-week curriculum with exercises, with slides, with everything to be used in the classroom so they can move ahead and do their coaching bit. 
We also do the application support, train the trainer, and then you can scale it out. Actually, I think in 12 countries, 213 different universities, 1,600 professors every semester, teach about 40,000 students how to use stuff on the most actual versions and are confident doing that on a week-by-week -week basis. And when the next version comes out in the next semester, they will have access to the next version and their preparation time will be minimized so they can fully concentrate on that inspiring and coach job to make a jump uh, down there. And that helps you because we build actually more pools. Here you see a pool landscape. All other different members of the ecosystem do that. And I'm very proud that I can show you a slide about Amazon Educate. Educate is a service that really helps you um, to um, be an initiative to provide students and educators with the necessary uh, material to really accelerate cloud-related learning. Imagine, before you heard about that the first time, you take a young person, say, hey, learn AWS, and you give them access to the website, and all the new terms that you have seen today are immediately speaking to you. So you have to have a guided path through that. And we'll do that by giving you uh, credits. You actually can use the services. Um, training, so that training is for the students and for the teachers, um, by a collaboration portal where you can uh, really look at, and most important, curated content content that has been tested, that's usable, and where you can look at and uh, then actually create more people versed with all the ver uh, services that AWS um, offers. So we give access to universities, uh, but also we even go to the point that we have a grant program for those who actually want to make use of AWS for their research. We've even have it the case that high school students have been applying for these grants because they have a great idea that they would like to implement, um, but actually need help and, and access to AWS services. If that, just let me go back a little bit to what Martin mentioned earlier on. That AWS Frankfurt is the fastest growing international region that we have. We have here in Berlin, well over 130 jobs available for you if you're interested in that. And we'll launch at the end of this year the pop-off loft in Berlin that will help you get access to great content on one hand or get, um, um, get support uh, for your questions. So you can go there to the loft um, to get solution architect help, but we also will have training and uh, certification uh, uh, tools available there for, for you. With all of this, you know, fighting the cloud is something like fighting gravity. Yeah? Cloud has become the new normal. If you're a company these days, you need to be able to move fast. You need to be able to focus exactly on those applications that you want to build.